Yeah, so like Mr. Danza said, I'm going to talk about my broad area of research over the last few years, which is um, focusing on urban environment, urban exposure zone, and how that might relate to mental health. So I'm going to give Okay. This is just a brief overview of, of what I'm going to cover. I'm going to talk a bit about why this is an interesting area of research to be involved in at the moment. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we mean by urban environmental exposures. I'm going to hopefully persuade you why mental health is an important area of research, but maybe I don't need to do that. Uh, talk a bit about how the environment might affect children's, children's mental health in particular. Little review of where the evidence is at the moment. Um, and then I'm going to talk about a couple of studies that I've been involved in. And then after that, I'm going to talk about some of the challenges of this type of research and then where, where I think maybe interesting directions to go next are. But before I start, I kind of want to know where everybody's knowledge and area of research is. Like, let's start with the exposures. Like, how many people are familiar with the urban environmental exposures? Things like air pollution, noise, green spaces. Could I have a show of hands that these are familiar or people have worked with them? Okay, so about half. And, um, and what about mental health? Who's done any research with mental health outcomes or knows much about mental health? Okay, about half as well. I just want to pitch how much time I spend explaining different things, and I don't want to spend ages on something if it's super familiar, but if it's half and half, I'll spend a bit of time on both. So why is this an interesting area of research to be involved in at the moment? It's very popular. Um, this is a, a couple of graphs I put together just sharing the number of publications. Yeah, that would be good. Take my so I can see how long I'm talking for. Ten plus twelve. So this is the increase in the number of publications. I just did a search for air pollution and depression, green space and depression. So in the last few years, it's been an explosion in research. This is a really, really popular area of research now. Um, why is that? Well, partly it's because um, mental health is a massive global problem, as I'm going to come on to. I think it's also because there's more and more, there's really good. Huh? It's back. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, there's a huge amount of data available now on mental health outcomes. So, I worked with, with Costanza and others in um, the Athlete Project. Um, before that, we worked in the Life Cycle Project. And these are big EU consortia that have harmonized a lot of data on mental health outcomes and data on environmental exposures. So, how much air pollution um, people in the bird cohort are exposed to, for example, or how close people live to green spaces. So this amount of, um, of data means that we can do lots of nice birth cohort research now, trying to see what the connections between these are. So I've talked about the urban environment. What do we mean by urban environment? Just we're thinking about the features of cities, the environmental features of cities that may, or other urban areas that may have an impact on human health. So one of these is air pollution. Um, as living in Torino, you're probably acquainted <laughs> with a lot of air pollution. Um, and most cities actually have levels of air pollution. Probably all cities have levels of air pollution which are well above the uh, recommended levels. Here I've got a statistic, 93% of children breathe air containing pollutants in the level excess of WHO guidelines. So air pollution is a massive problem, and air pollution comes from lots of sources, from industry, in cities, cars probably is the main source of air pollution. Um, and if you cycle around Torino, which you know some of you do, and I have done for the last six weeks, I can <laughs> attest to the levels of air pollution. <laughs> and again, coming back to cars, which are 
pretty much the problem for everything. Um, road traffic noise, again, a huge amount of um, people living in cities are exposed to levels of road traffic noise above recommended guidelines. And there's a huge variation in the access that people have to green spaces. So I don't know this the data, but for me, Torino is quite a green city, having lived in other cities. So I, I feel like it's really green. You've got Valentino, Valentino Park, what's that how you call it? Yeah. Super nice park, lots of trees. Yeah. So Torino is quite a green city, but plenty of other cities have much, much less green space. Um, Copenhagen, where I work, has a lot of green spaces. Barcelona, where I was last year, I would say much less than Torino, actually. Um, you've got a nice sea and some trees, but much, much less in the way of, of parks. So these are the aspects of the environment that we're interested in. And why are we interested in mental health problems? We're interested in mental health problems, especially amongst children, because it's a huge global problem. So rates of mental health problems overall are relatively stable since 1990, but the specific um, disorders have changed. So the, the specific types of mental health problems that affect children have changed. I've got a slide on that in a minute. And the latest data I found estimated about 12% of children suffer from a mental health problem um, and that it mental health conditions accounts for one of the highest, they're one of the highest causes of um, loss of disability adjusted life years. Um, and a lot of the, the, a lot of the loss of life comes from suicide um, and self-harm. So this accounts for quite a big chunk of the disability adjusted life years associated with mental health outcome, with mental health problems. And here I've just got a graph about the, the different types of mental health problems that affect children. Um, I'm not sure whether you can see here. Yeah. You can probably just about see. I mean, the thing that I pick out from this is, especially amongst boys, things like at uh, young ages, things like conduct disorders are the, a big chunk of child mental health problems, which is children not doing as they're told, fighting. Um, but as children age, you see that actually this changes a lot, and drug use disorders, self harm, Become the main um, source of mental health problems in early adulthood. And for young men, especially, suicide is a massive problem. And this, I think, accounts for possibly the most deaths amongst, uh, amongst young adults um, of, all, of all deaths due to suicide. So, the big question as good epidemiologists is why we might think that the environment has an impact, has a cause and effect on mental health. And there's a few different mechanisms that have been postulated um, for different exposure outcome relationships. So there's some evidence that air pollution can have a biological effect on depression, um, that it's a source of information, that it can affect the HPA access, axis which is a biological system that manages the body's response to stress. So there's some evidence that air pollution exposure is associated with HPA stimulation, and in turn, that chronic HPA activation is associated with worse mental health. Um, I don't think the effect sizes are that strong from what I've read. I don't think this is going to account for a massive amount of variance in explaining depression, but it's one postulated pathway. Similarly for traffic noise, again, there's evidence that traffic noise can affect mental health via HPA axis stimulation. But there's other potential routes as well. Um, traffic noise can affect sleep, which could then potentially um, lead to worse mental health. And also it's just a general stressor which can affect mental health. Although with noise, this is a digression. So I think that probably with my psychologist hat on, actually noise more like antisocial noise from neighbours or people above, it's probably going to have a more detrimental effect on mental health because it's uh, intermittent and it has a sort of social aspect that you're lying in bed at, at, at trying to sleep and your neighbours are up until four in the morning. I think road traffic noise probably more get used to because it is a continuous um, 
kind of a continuous noise that you get used to. But these other types of noise are much more difficult to measure than road traffic noise. Nature and mental health. Again, this is a huge source of interest at the moment. Um, and I would say this is probably the pathway for which there's the strongest evidence that it may affect mental health. And there, there's a number of routes by which green spaces may be beneficial to mental health. Um, one is as a sort of as a source of stress reduction. Um, and there's some evidence, some ideas that humans have an innate um, affinity to other species and being around nature with high biodiversity, there's some evidence that's linked with lower self-reported stress. Nature gives opportunities to exercise. So again, this um, exercise has a pretty strong um, relationship with mental health. And if you live in a green space, then you have more opportunity to, to run, do other forms of exercise. But again, I think the quality of green space is important. I mean, you could live in a very unsafe field where you don't want to go and make, live near somewhere very unsafe, you don't want to exercise, or you could live near a beautiful park with lots of facilities. So again, this is harder to measure, but I think important. Now, this is something I know nothing about. Does anyone know about the microbiota theory? And um, I mean, I'm not going to put you on the spot by asking to explain. This is something that I've, I've kind of come across in my reading, but it, um, it's not something that I know much about. But again, there's a theory that uh, increased biodiversity in green, sp green spaces can improve the immune system. And again, some evidence that microbiome and the immune system is related to mental health. My sense is that that last link, the evidence isn't super strong, but I'm prepared to be corrected by anybody who knows more about this than me. Another way that green spaces could Im impact mental health and other forms of health is that generally they have lower le levels of air pollution. If you have a park and you don't have roads in it, then you're not going to have emissions from road traffic. So this is this is one other mechanism. Okay, that's ten minutes. I'm happy to take questions or comments as I go along. Um, I don't know whether anyone, anyone has any questions, want to discuss any of that, or wait till the end. Okay. So what is the observational evidence for associations between these exposures and mental health? Now, I put together this quite unsystematic umbrella review. I basically spent a day, this was for some teaching, and I, I spent a day just looking, or a couple of days just looking at meta-analyses that have looked at associations between these exposures and mental health outcomes, meta-analyses or systematic reviews. I didn't do this in a systematic way, but I found all of them I could and then just summarised them, trying to see where the balance of evidence is. So things which are in dark red are where there's strong evidence or meta-analysis found significant associations between the exposure and the outcome. Light red is less strong evidence, maybe non-significant associations. Green is where I couldn't find the systematic review or meta-analysis. Uh, uh, sorry, gray is where I couldn't find the systematic review or meta-analysis. And then green is the other direction, so protective association. Um, and how would I summarize this? I think you can see that there is reasonably consistent evidence um, that air pollution may have a detrimental effect on depression and also neurodevelopmental outcomes like autism and ADHD. And the interesting one I thought was uh, interesting that's at the end actually quite consistent evidence that air pollution was related associated with higher suicide rates. There's also reasonably consistent evidence that exposure to green spaces is protective against a range of um, mental health problems. But there's also some stuff which doesn't quite make sense here. And I'm going to come back to some of this. So there's one systematic review, re review that found a greater exposure to NO2 was protected against anxiety. And there was a couple of systematic reviews here that had con contradictory findings about the association between PM10 and some mental health outcomes. So some finding protective effects and some finding harmful effects. And I've been involved in quite a few studies where we found apparent protective effects of air pollution for certain mental health outcomes. 
Uh, and I was in a seminar with a guy that said that he'd read some evidence that there could be a causal um, effect of this, but my inclination is it's more to do with confounding, um, which I'm going to come on to. I don't want to talk about Amma, so I'm going to try and move on. And also, other, other outcomes where there's just no evidence at all. So things like psychosis and bipolar, which are kind of more severe um, types of mental health problems, very little evidence about how the environment might affect this. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a couple of studies that I've been involved in, which have been trying to study associations between some of these exposures and mental health outcomes. So the first one, which we submitted last week, and it hasn't bounced back yet, so maybe it went out to review, which would be nice. Um, and so maybe it's quite a nice journal. Was looking at associations between different aspects of the urban environment and postpartum depression. Oh, and Kiara and Elena are involved in this. So here we use data from um, the EU child cohort network, so the life cycle project. Who really knows about the life cycle project? Okay. I knew you guys did. <laughs> but thank you for putting your hands up. Um, so this is the, the EU consortium I mentioned earlier, where we have harmonized data on a lot of um, number of EU birth cohorts, including on interview cohorts. Um, and the aim of this study was to look at associations between, I think we had seven exposures in the end, three, four, seven or eight exposures and maternal postpartum depression. So postpartum depression is maternal depression that onsets following childbirth. So we were looking here to see associations between ambient air pollution, road traffic noise, natural spaces and built environments with um, with postpartum depression. And we did a two stage meta analysis. So we conducted the analysis in each individual cohort and then combined the estimates by, uh, by meta analysis. And we did this using data shield. Now I spoke to Lorenzo the other day and he told me that he thought it would be interesting if I'd given a presentation on data shield and federated analysis. Um, but he didn't actually tell me this. So <laughs> this is why I'm presenting on, on this and not federated analysis. I'm also not sure that 40 minutes on federated analysis would have been more interesting than this. <laughs> I think it could have increased the risk of suicide so far. <laughs> um, but I'll put a slide in about federated analysis and data shield. So the way this project set up, it's a clever idea, but it's difficult, I think, would be the summary. So rather than transferring all of the data around, there's this whole infrastructure developed whereby each cohort, so we had, how many cohorts did we have here? 11 birth cohorts. Each cohort hosts their own data on a server, and you, the researcher, can access this data remotely. But the key thing is you can't see the data. So you can send analysis commands, these are processed from the servers, you get summary statistics back, and then you can pull these summary statistics. So you're kind of doing analysis without looking at the data. In some ways it's super neat, but as Cassandra and other people know, it also has very, very early in development and is very, very difficult and time consuming to do. But all of this analysis was done using data shield. And this is the cohorts we included. So we had Ausback, BIB from the UK, BNBC, Danish birth cohort, French cohorts, uh, Spain, Spanish cohorts, INMA, uh, MOBA, NINFIA, RIA. So we had a nice number of cohorts across the whole of um, whole of the EU. I feel like I'm talking quicker and quicker as I get into this presentation. If I move into light speed talking, you can tell me to slow down. <laughs> Um, and we had data on pretty much uh, everything that we wanted. Um, PM10 wasn't represented in all the cohorts. And I'm just going to show you one slide of the results. I think a lot of it was pretty normal, I would say, to be honest. We found some evidence that PM10 here may be associated with an increased risk of postpartum depression, the to watch ratio three. You can see confidence intervals and crossing null. Evidence for NO2 and P PM2.5, other air pollutants were pretty null. Um, maybe some evidence that greater road traffic noise increased risk of postpartum depression, but wasn't kind of super, super convincing. 
and for green space so we had MVVI which is a, a satellite based measure of average green space or the amount of green space within a buffer um, it was about as null as you can get really so yeah we didn't find we didn't find much so positive so we didn't find much associations here many associations here at all and I'm going to come back and talk about maybe why that was. I'm going to touch briefly on another project I've done, but then I really want to talk about some of the methodological stuff, um, which I think is interesting in this area of research. So this was a study, rather than focusing on postnatal mental health and maternal mental health, we were focused on child mental health. Um, and the approach is, which we haven't finished yet, was to do an exposure and wide association study. So rather than just selecting a priori a few exposures, we're going to take 30, 40 exposures. We're going to take all the exposures and we're going to see how they associate with child mental health. And then we want to do some sort of variable selection, dimension reduction. Currently we can't because it's not available in data shield, but this is on the cards. So, so far we've done the first bit, the, the X, Y part. And the, the cohorts were similar cohorts to the previous study, so looking at child mental health outcomes rather than parenting. And this is uh, plot showing associations between each of the exposures, and um, this is externalizing, so this is internalizing, so like anxiety, depression. It's going to be hard to read what all of these exposures are, but. Um, they're all also mostly close enough. They are all um, all the confidence intervals, or almost all the confidence intervals are uh, overlapping with zero. And once you apply any sort of correction for multiple testing, um, nothing survives. And this is um, similar for externalizing. So this is more like child behavior problems. And again, we have the same wide range of exposures. And still, we found very little associations between any of these exposures and mental health. Um, population density uh, is a high population density is associated with a slight increased risk of um, externalizing. But again, this is these are uncorrected. And I mean, I know we've had conversations about correcting for multiple testing, but yeah, if you apply some sort of correction for multiple testing, then um, then none of these survive. So not a, not a huge amount of, um, of associations. So what I want to, how, 20 minutes, how's everyone's consolidate concentration? Can you take another 10 or 15 minutes? Okay. So what this has got me thinking about is why, why is there? Why have we got a whole lot of null? I think is is one question that I've been thinking about a lot, and I want to go through some of the reasons that we found quite a lot of null findings, and also talk about some of the reasons that there's actually inconsistent findings. I mean, one I think we need to consider is maybe there's no effect that actually, you know, conceptually we might think that these things are important for mental health, but uh, there's other things that are more important, you know, socioeconomic factors, for example. Home factors. Um, uh, so I think we need to we need to consider that maybe these aren't enough of a stressor to cause severe mental health problems. One option. I think there's another huge issue about how we measure these exposures. Um, so in all of these studies, these exposures are based on residential address. So they're estimated exposure based on where somebody lives. Or based where the parents um, parents live, presumably the child as well. And the problem with this is people don't spend all of their time just sat at home. People move around a lot, especially if people work. So we might have a lot of exposure misclassification. It's quite a crude measure of people's actual exposure to all of the things that we're talking about, um, like air pollution. Um, you know, the green space measures that we use, we don't have much information, at least in these cohorts, about. Like I said, the quality of green spaces, the safety of green spaces. So I still think, even though amazing work's been done on exposure classification, it's quite crude. 
Um, and I think this is changing now. I mean, I think what, what, what is being developed now, which is really interesting, is a lot more personal monitoring. So strapping pollution monitors on people as they go about their daily life and trying to get much, much more fine grained um, estimates of what people are actually exposed to. And I think this is going to improve the quality of these studies to no end. Measuring mental health is also very tricky. Um, and in my previous incarnation, I, I did a lot of philosophy and you can spend hours talking about philosophical issues around um, mental health, but people are very, very complicated. And mental health problems are very, very complicated. And even trying to understand the relationship between the mind and the brain, I mean, that's, that's impossibly complicated. Um, but what we generally work with in these cohort studies is every four years, somebody fills out a questionnaire that has 10 items that says things like, I felt sad in the last week, or I felt anxious in the last week, and they rate themselves out of four. And then you add that up and you have a score, and that's their mental health. Um, and the reason that we do use this approach in birth cohort studies is because it's um, it's quite easy and it's quite cheap. Um, you can just give people a questionnaire and they can fill it out. And I'm not saying it's worthless. I think it definitely captures something if people fill out these questionnaires and say they feel terrible all the time and they're thinking of killing themselves, then I think their mental health is, you're capturing something, but it's still quite a crude measurement. Now, there are alternatives. You can use structured interviews, which are much more lengthy and probably get more information on mental health outcomes, but they're a lot more expensive than if you have a cohort of 15,000 people and you trying to conduct 15,000 interviews, which you need a psychologist or trained rater to do. I mean, that's incredibly expensive. So it's very hard to get that level of data. You can also use registry-based data. So in uh, Scandinavia, they've got lots of nice registry-based data. But there's, again, problems with this. I mean, one is an issue of selection bias that it's there's selection into who accesses services and the socioeconomic factors that affect who actually access services so these aren't necessarily an unbiased um, estimate of mental health problems or an unbiased measure of mental health problems and they also only catch the most severe end of the distribution of mental health problems. you can also do qualitative research which i really like but again it's quite hard to fit qualitative research into this sort of quantitative paradigm that we're working within And actually confounding, I mean, I think confounding is a huge issue in these studies, and this is what I'm going to finish by talking about. Um, I mean, this isn't a gag, this is just a few simple boxes, but your socioeconomic circumstances affect massively where you live because they affect what you, where you can afford to rent or buy a property. And where you live, it massively affects your air pollution exposure. And we know that your socioeconomic circumstances massively affect your mental health. So. I don't need to explain confounding to epidemiologists, but I think this is a massive, massive problem. And whilst we still adjust for it, I, still, yeah, I think it could potentially explain some of the um, some of the null found findings. It could potentially explain some of the null findings because um, in some it's very heterogeneous. It's very different between cities. Um, some cities, if you're rich, you live in areas with lower air pollution, and some cities, if you're rich, you live in areas of high pollution. Um, but some cities, you know, the most desirable areas are right in the centre where you have higher levels of air pollution. So it's not necessarily the case that poor people are more exposed to, exposed to air pollution. So I think this differential effect, um, this differential confounding, could explain some of the inconsistent findings. Okay. I'm going to finish with a, some few thoughts. So what I've started thinking about recently is, OK, there's really nice, uh, lots of people have done really nice model inputs designs. Not so many of them have been applied to environmental epidemiology, and fewer still have been applied to mental health research and environmental epidemiology. So I started thinking, and I put a grant application together about how what some of the causal inference methods are that maybe we could use and how we could apply these to environmental and mental health research. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go over a few, but this is this I'd be really interested to get some of your thoughts on. So one thing I thought we could use, try is using a neg negative outcome control. So negative can probably mostly be no negative control designs, but just to go over briefly. 
They evaluate nucleus confounding by conducting parallel analysis between the exposure of interest and the separate outcomes, which is a negative control outcome. So you select an outcome on the basis that it's likely to have the same uh, confounding structure as the relationship between your exposure and outcome of interest. But there's no plausible mechanism by which the exposure could cause a negative control outcome. Now, the tricky thing is to try to think of what a good negative control outcome is, could be. Now, what I've put here, which I'm really interested to your thoughts on, is whether you can use unhealthy child diet as a negative control outcome. Because my thinking was that it's going to be quite socially patterned. It may be affected by neighbourhood type characteristics. So similar things that are potentially confounding between uh, neighbourhood and mental health. But say for air pollution, for example, I couldn't think of any plausible mechanism by which exposure to air pollution could cause children to have an unhealthy or less healthy diet. So the idea is that you conduct parallel analysis using this as an outcome and see if you find similar or different findings to your outcome of interest. It's an idea. I'd be interested to see what you think about this. So, so negative con outcome controls or one if you can think of a good one. This is a nice paper by Alessandra Palmer, who's Italian. I don't know. I'm just assuming because you're Italian, maybe you know Alessandra Palmer. Um, so this is by somebody called Alessandra Palmer. Um, she did a really nice study which was using rainfall as an instrument for air pollution um, because when it rains it washes away um, levels of air pollution so she she had a lot of italian data i haven't um i can't off the top of my head remember what italian data she used the studies in the references um, so the idea is that rather than measuring pm 10.2.5 or whatever your air pollution exposure is and using that as an exposure, you use rainfall as an instrument for air pollution. Um, because you think that rainfall is not affected by the same confounding as air pollution. Um, so it could potentially give a non-biased estimate. The issue with this, which I've been trying to think about, is that you need to make sure that your instrument isn't related to your outcome. And the point that somebody made to me is, yeah, but what if it rains all the time yeah. and you don't exactly. go out of the house because you, you then you get really miserable. Because like, I was really miserable in Copenhagen because it rained all the time, yeah. <laughs> which is why I'm in Turin now. Um, but I, th I think one thing about this is I think actually if anything, it would, let me get this straight in my head. I think the direction of effect of anything would be move. more rainfall would cause more PM2.5 exposure and if potentially more rainfall would cause, I need to think about it. That's interesting. That's true. If you spend all the time inside, because it trains and not get these things. I haven't thought about that. Yeah, okay, that's problematic. That's problematic. Um, anyway, we can we can think about this. But I think trying to think of instruments is a nice is a nice approach to this as well. Now, this is the last one, which again is quite interesting, which is trying to do, do natural experiments. And there's a nice paper here again in the reference that um, uses quasi natural experiments using changing residential address. So the idea is that you, so for example, I, I kind of, this is a, a, a simplified version of the design in this study is where you try to characterize four groups. So people who You try to characterize four groups. So people that start off living in areas of higher pollution and move to higher areas of higher pollution, people who start off living in areas of higher pollution and move to areas of low air pollution. And then you can do the converse. People start doing low pollution, move to low and low to high. So then you have these different groups and you can see 
it's a yeah, it's a quasi natural experiment to see whether the ones moving from low to high air pollution show some worsening in mental health, or the ones that are moving from high air pollution to low air pollution show improvement in mental health. I mean, the key, key, key problem with this design is that the assumption is that that people that move and people that don't move um, are identical, which is almost certainly not the case. So then in this paper, they applied some sort of uh, propensity score matching to try to match the movers with the non-movers. Um, I thought it was quite a nice design. So again, I think this is a design with the sort of data that we have that we could definitely apply to mental health outcomes. I'm going to try to do this. Never get some more money. 